Hi. Um, so when Bianca and I had a brief conversation over the phone to prepare for today, and, and I, I th thank her for, for inviting me. And then I said, well, what, what do you expect me to, to do? Um, and she said, well, I would like to learn something new today. Well, what I've been to talk in artificial intelligence or anything else. So if that could be done, that was great. And then I just want you to say what you think data science is. Um, and seeing how it works with the statistics. And we had a, a quite entertaining conversation. And, and this is the result. I will say that um, this is, I'm a computer scientist. So when I'm going to reflect about data science and what it is, I'm going to say what I think data science is. I, as a computer scientist, I think I cannot detach myself, or anyone can detach themselves when they give the impression about, about an area. So, I, and then, oh, we debated over the phone uh, about the title, and, uh, and you know how it goes about titles. And, and I ended up with this. Uh, and there is a difference, you can notice, between the original title and the, and the structure of the talk, um, just because I wanted to end up in a, in a positive note. I didn't want to talk about pitfalls at last, and um, actually wanted to, there are um, <clears throat> actually many positive things to, to look forward to. Um, so I'm gonna give my impression what underpins data science, um, and then, and that's a tr an attempt to give you a definition by intention, which is rather challenging, I found. Um, so I found it easier to give you a definition by extension, just showing examples of what we see when we do research, uh, what I've done research. Um, and then, very important, is uh, some practices that we catch up in the literature or that we have experienced, we conducted some research that um, we, 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 can, we can lead to what I call over-optimism, meaning that we have fantastic results that actually cannot be replicated. And then let's talk about the future. Um, so I'm a computer scientist, I'm an engineer. I, I, I build systems. So for me, data science tries to address those engineering practices that, that support data-driven. And I talk about healthcare because that's my domain. So that means uh, and I really like the metaphor, the triangle, when we talk about statistics. So when I was looking at that slide, I think the data science tried to expand the language or vocabulary that you can use to connect the two, the two worlds. Um, what is a data-driven healthcare? Well, I will refer you to, to Adrian Smith address to the Royal Statistical Society in 1996 when we, he talked about a fantastic paper on, on evidence-based practice, evidence-based society. Which is, um, which is essentially trying to, at any level that we act, but base our decisions on, on evidence. And, and, and I will come to what that means. From, from a computer science point of view, what I'm interested in is uh, how, uh, not only on how I make predictions, but most importantly, how, what are optimal decisions based on those, on those predictions. Uh, but, you know, how bad can my, my predictions be, and still I can, I can hit the targets. Uh, very difficult, what are the value functions that I have to attribute to different ac courses of action so I can act optimally. Then uh, we, of course, are concerned with uh, human decision making, but there is a, a slight deterred when or most of the time we, are, we, we talk about data driven, and that means automatic. That means not necessarily acting as humans will do, but we're trying to imagine that you try to tr train machines on how to act optimally. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there are many or, uh, degrees of how you can give support to an evidence base or, or data driven organization. You can be all familiar with how uh, people try to create fantastic visualizations of data and predictions. Uh, actually provide those predictions, and then and then we have systems that provide uh, out recommended actions uh, specifically. And um, I think the state of the art, um, and we see it when we when we talk about. Uh, uh, we'll show a healthcare example, but when we talk about 
uh, chess mach player machines, etc., automatic planning. So machines that they can not only do a prediction and execute an action, but actually can create a plan and execute a sequence of actions that end in an optimal result. And that, for me, is the, the aim, or at least the wish, at the very aim at the end of what data science should be. Um, of course, data science, uh, I, I said earlier, expands the, the language that we use to connect the, the, what the data we observe with our theories. Uh, and in doing so, um, we need uh, data models, we need hardware, and that's also a concern in data science. Why? Because we need to facilitate the use of data. And, uh, and in every research question that we uh, pose over a data set, immediately we say induce a data model, meaning creates a sort of table, or might be more complicated than a table. And, and that is a problem that uh, we also address in this area, how we create data models that are more amenable to research, that are easier. Then uh, <clears throat> uh, one problem that is common, uh, I would say in data science or in computational st in, in statistics, is the problem of model selection. It's very well understood. Uh, I will allow myself to say that in, in, in the domain of statistics, I will say is less well understood in the world of uh, data science and, and in machine learning. Uh, it's a discipline underpinned by many others. Um, people call to me as a data scientist, I, I, I just found out uh, I'm a computer scientist uh, and I work in health informatics. Um, so now some people call me a health data scientist. Um, but what brought me here, it wasn't only that I needed to, to be proficient in, in areas like computational uh, uh, algorithms, but also have a good background in probability theory that we cannot escape that. Uh, that was one, one of my points. Uh, we embrace all the new advances that, that machine learning provides, and I will talk a little bit about that. But then also we have to talk about uh, database models because we, we, have, we want our research to be executed easily and, and streamlined. And, uh, and because it's so computationally expensive, we have to learn to use uh, distributed high performance computing. And that's also an area of concern with, uh, in, in the domain of data science. We have to construct not only the, the, the predictions tools, model decisions, but also end up uh, as a byproduct platforms, hardware, and software that can support the research. Um, so that was a brief introduction to, to too many words uh, about data science. I like more to talk about examples, and in examples, I, I, I like pictures. So, and I, and I have to go through the literature and find out many examples, and I'm gonna give you a brief overview. Um, I had to leave many out of them and I thought that so were incredibly interesting. Uh, I'm made he, uh, at UCL, for instance, one using computational and scheduling algorithms to, to organize the Q and A and E departments and find out whether the four hour tar uh, target could be met uh, by organizing the patients in, in interesting ways. I found that really interesting. Or <clears throat> another one, using a technique called constraint satisfaction problem that come from computer science, where you decide when to clean the ambulances. So the ambulances are still available, but they are always clean as they should be. Uh, and then I have a long list. I selected this because I had a better, some better pictures to show. So then I, I wanted to start with a, with a really inspirational example, I would say. Not, not data science per se, I mean the data science here this is, this is a work by one of our former students, and, um, and he's a cardiologist. Uh, they work day in and out in, in management, share Spain, and provide and create a hypothesis. This is, and then, and then what it was interesting is that they formulate a hypothesis in one day and propose a different ways to, to manage chest pain. Um, and they did a trial, a small randomized controlled trial. And what was interesting is that you know, in, in, in about two years, they were saving 20% of the cost. This is what we call a null 
uh, outcome trials. So in both arms of the trial, the patient experienced the same outcomes. Uh, but what was interesting um, uh, from, from this is that we, they, they were able to detect a different way of managing the patient with existing technology and, and render that dramatic saving of uh, money, uh, which could be obviously dedicated elsewhere. What is interesting of this example is motivated area of research is actually trying to, we, we know we try to represent the care pathways of the patients and we can look at them in the electronic records. Can we, and the question is, can we explore all these pathways that, and find similar uh, ways in what manner the patient navigating these networks and that is uh, uh, navigating this network so that we can improve service delivery. So this is my, my first example. Really interesting uh, they just posted uh, because from the outset uh, when they started this work there was the actual the current guidance that the, the NICE uh, uh, presented. It will, will have increased the cost of management of the patient. So that's the first example. Uh, this is a little bit more data science, it's still in the domain of statistics. So this is um, another work for former students of ours, and they, and they work in a hospital, and they need to plan the bed allocations. And those beds, well, you get a measurement of an estimate of how many patients will arrive tomorrow, and with that estimate, you decide whether you have to allocate outliers or overflow beds, and, and that's important or that's relevant because every different type of bed has a, uh, well, at least an observable uh, different uh, morbidity and mortality. So the way you allocate patients into these beds are important. And, uh, and the current model that they were using in, in, the, in the trust is the standard six-week moving average, which I understand from her is, is used across the NHS. And please correct me if I'm mistaken. So, so we went and looked at the, at the data. This is data for trust, and this is especially maternity trust. And there was, a, um, and there was all sort of hypotheses. Should we look at weather? Should we look at all sorts of variables? And, and I, in the end, it was really interesting because the model only required to know it was a pure time series model looking at the previous history of a year, only using the number of admissions, emergency admission periods. So, but the analysis was quite different. The analysis was not the standard uh, time series analysis. It was based on a Fury analysis. So there was the assumption that we did was a periodic uh, process. And uh, so we have to uh, could give you the uh, details about the trigonometric uh, box uh, adjusted ARIMA model that, that we use. Uh, but the interesting thing is that it has the smallest number of variables required. Uh, instead of having to, a very complex models that will make our that will make us wary of using our predictions. Most surprisingly, the error reduction went from 20% to 2%. In, in the next day, I'm not talking two weeks or three months, of course the error bands there go for, for the next two days, it was so close to reality that they were felt really happy about it. Um, interestingly enough, one of the key issues in this model was to stratify the data by age. So, so they, they, they were really excited. Uh, so, so two main interesting observations, one that children couldn't be planning anyway, so they have to uh, allocate a top capacity for, for children. And then in the other population, they could achieve a very good prediction. That was very good. Um, so so we'll, that, that is the second example that I, I was really interested in. And then there was a connection between this and finding out uh, whether the patient would respond, have shorter length of a stay, uh, depending on the kind of bed that they were allocated. Another example, and now we move from, so we look at uh, clinician hypothesis, then some statistical analysis still, uh, uh, and then now we move more into the realm of new other techniques, and machine learning techniques, although um, I will say decision traits come from the statistical literature. We have logistic regression there, but we have all the all the candidates there support back to machines. So what is this case? This is looking at pharma, 
pharmacotherapy management in Parkinson's disease. So normally Parkinson's disease patient, they, <clears throat> for a while, are managed with physiotherapy and other techniques, and there is a point at which deciding to transfer them to pharmacotherapy. And that point can be, but it's not, it's not quite clear. So the idea is that we monitor this patient remotely. Uh, so they use wearables, um, so the mobile phone or any, any other machine. And f we try to predict where, at the point at which they require to be uh, f you know, further refer for further investigations and see whether it should be transferred. And um, so it was quite, quite uh, so it was interesting because the data was um, incredibly noisy as you will expect, um, and they use a protocol. This is a public data set. Uh, but we managed to, what, what was interesting from this, this study is two things, and now I try to, is that we actually managed to achieve quite good results instead, instead of prediction. Uh, two things to observe that I said to the students is, one is like, well, give your prediction, but always put a confidence interval around that prediction, please. Uh, and other, and, and I will come later on to some of the typical pitfalls in, in doing this kind of analysis. Then always include your base uh, logistic regression model as a baseline comparison. Why would you do anything more complex is you can have the simplest model, and that is the uh, Occam's razor or model selection. You select the simplest model that models reality more faithfully. Um, and, and here there is an issue. Um, in the domain of statistics, finding out what is a more complex model is, is being thoroughly studied. Whereas when you talked about um, a support vector machine, um, well, in that there is theory as well, the DC dimension. But when you try to compare logistic regression with all the models that not necessarily share a structure, talking about complexity of the model to make a fair comparison, and I mean a fair comparison when the uh, predicted ability is relatively the same, it's, it's not, uh, it's so far, in the, uh, as I understand, uh, as I've seen it in, in data science, in machine learning, uh, uh, a process that is ad hoc to, to the expert. We try to inform with the clinicians, and we somehow try to look at, for instance, if the decision tree has an evident structure, so it's not, it's not a, an assembly tree, uh, then we can see clearly it is less, uses less variables, for instance, than a <coughs> logistic regression. So this was a, a, quite an interesting uh, result, um, just because of it could do very well. Uh, another interesting area that is a big concern in, you know, well, in statistics, in epidemiology, and in data science, and is data quality control. Uh, we all hear about, uh, no, well, rubbish. I was going to say noise in, noise out, but well, you can say rubbish in, rubbish out. So this is work that we've been collaborating with uh, I, um, uh, a group in Valencia, in Spain, and they were, we tried to create, uh, they, they have created algorithms that look at um, <clears throat> how to create indicators of changes in trend in the data that will indicate that there are unwarranted changes and they look over time. So they use, the, what they have done is to map to the analog of physical quantities like velocity, like acceleration, and create an analogs for the world of data. And then they use electronic records and study how the distributions of the variables in the electronic records experience these changes over time. So what is interesting, uh, I recommend thoroughly the publication underneath. What you see on top is current research that we're performing here at the IHI, where I belong, when we're looking at CPRD data. And what you try to look in these funny pictures is abrupt changes. And those changes are interesting because it signals, although there isn't, we haven't defined a threshold, uh, it signals there have been a, an abrupt change in the way the data is recorded. We're not talking about changes in how the data present, it's how the data is recorded. And then you have to uh, go and find out what be the, uh, the cause of that change. So we are studying, for instance, what happened when the prompts were introduced to see if, whether that have had any effect on 
how the data was recorded and why that's important. But we like objective measurement of quality of the data that you're using for your research. If you define a cohort, and in that cohort, uh, unadvertently, we, there is a sudden change in the trend, then the conclusions, or, or even the, me the choice of methodology that you d decide to, to, to analyze that data so it might be put into question. So this is quite interesting. They have applied these uh, algorithms for the mortality registry in, in Spain. Uh, also maternity uh, services in Spain and also to data sets in the US and in all of them have found interesting changes in the data which are, are important to be highlighted and then you can uh, make adjustment in the way you define your cohorts to make your analysis uh, well first valid and then perhaps have better predictions from them. Um, so something that we find, so it's a different area. Now, now I move so being from a hypothesis to data quality and advancing in methods. And in each one of them, the reason I put them here is I'm using a completely diff different language. So from a scientific hypothesis to time series to um, uh, using physical modeling of information. And now this is a different experience. This is also uh, research that was done at uh, the Royal Free Hospital. And, uh, and it's a system that recommend treatment actions. So it goes beyond what the predictions do, and it says this, uh, and this is the breast cancer, well, the best recommended action for this particular patient is a breast conservation. And it gives a straight recommendation. And it was trial, tried at the Royal Freak Hospital, and it did quite well. So um, this is nothing new. This is 10 years old, by the way. But it's quite interesting because there are many, many challenges. Imagine you, that you have performed your statistical research and that have come up with a very strong result or a clinical trial and we have found out what are the, 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 the relevance or importance of, of, of an effect size of a particular drug. Um, what uh, you see at the top is an MDT acting real time. And each one, and, and in that room, about 30 patients every Wednesday morning, 7.30, go uh, as, uh, analyzed by the panel of consultants, uh, each average time about two minutes. And in those two minutes, they have to recommend the best treatment action for that patient. In the domain of breast cancer, we studied this. They, they, look, they consider around 17 high quality guidance. And imagine the process on, on creating those guidance, and around up to 200 publications, primary sources. All that at the same time to make a decision. Of course, it's very intrinsically difficult to clinicians to, to uh, not only to be updated, but to do that real time, although you might be surprised that the consultants on that line do it in a, we measure in less than half a second, um, which is fantastic. The, the first time they, the system took two seconds, they thought it didn't work and it was rubbish. Uh, so we have to spend two months optimizing the system. Uh, so it will work really fast. But what is interesting, the, the real contribution, apart from being trialed and lovely user interface and that we could do a real-time audit on the patients, was that it pro provides an objective um, model on how clinicians harmonize evidence from different sources. And here the data is not numbers, here the data are evidence. The data items are <coughs> papers, are guidance, recommendation, and how to harmonize them to come up with a treatment recommendation. Um, this was, a, for me, a, I was far younger, but then I was a previous, it was result of research in Cancer Research UK, and the late uh, Mo, Professor Mo Keshkar uh, was leading the project and Professor John Fox. Um, but this is quite exciting. There, is a, there, there are caveats, there are problems. Uh, we, we have the bottlenecks of creating guidance. We have the bottlenecks of representing the evidence. And he, but it can do as good as, and if I can highlight the bottom line there, as being in concordance with the evidence at a high level, 97%. And in, from that perspective, it wasn't distinguishable for an expert consultant. So that's quite good. 
Uh, why? Well, it's not that we're going to replace consultants, but obviously we, we were in the presence of one of the best breast cancer unit in the country. Uh, we have junior doctors and all the uh, different environments across the country where systems like this can be deployed and could offer a second opinion. We have cases where uh, clinicians from other countries wanted a second opinion where you could say, uh, I use this over the web and, and whether I agree or disagree. Um, uh, interesting anecdote is that most of the time the consultant will ignore the system. And that's good. Why? Uh, because they were happy with it. So it's fine. It's like you're agreeing all the time. And the second important thing to me in that ex anecdote is that when there was a disagreement, after a while, uh, this is, doesn't happen overnight, you develop trust. After a while, if there was a disagreement, there was an imperative to find out why. So is it problems in the data? Is it problem in the documentation? Is it, pro is, is it that we are not aware of the best evidence for this particular case? So it's really interesting. Uh, and this, for me, is the well, we should go. Uh, so I have presented different examples of domains of where I believe data science plays a role. Uh, not only we're playing with data, data can be also uh, objects. Um, we say we learn concept, we use uh, evidence, and we want to use evidence in ways that we can solve problems like harmonizing these different sources. Um, so I hope I you find it interesting. Now, now I move to the pitfalls. Um, and, I, and I didn't want to be a part of over there. Uh, but there are some issues that I find along the way when we work in data science. So we teach uh, the modules in data science to, you know, at the institute. And of course, we come through many publications. And, and we find that there are some issues. Uh, nothing that we have, we are originally acknowledging. I think it's a, it's, it's, it's so well, uh, it's so common that even there are chapters in books dedicated to this. So I, I, here I highlight some. Uh, one of the typical ones is, is how people imp implement uh, cross-validation. And, and I, I'm here taking the liberty to assume that everybody knows what cross-validation is, and I'm sure you do. Um, but then uh, we find that there are issues in, in the way people implement it. Um, <clears throat> there are serious problems in the world of data science on selecting the best model, basically because we evaluate the model just by the prediction. And, and there is not a reflection about what's the complexity of the problem, which is the other important element to balance in the selection. If we have very complex models, even though they are offer very high prediction, we, have a, uh, we should be uh, cautious in the way whether that model will generalize correctly. Um, and then from, from our own research is uh, uh, issues about presenting p-values for penalized regression models, which is being now properly addressed in some publications. Um, and, then, and I'm going to show some examples about uh, simple things that are apparently uh, people are less concerned when they try to apply this method. For instance, having an adequate sample size when you apply penalized regression models. It, they're just done. Uh, and, it, and the reason is not, uh, the, the reason is, no, is, is not incompetence in any way, is it because it's an area that's been developed over the last 12, 15 years, and, and, the, and, and it's not easy to find out what are the bounds. Uh, they're not even a, a, an, an equation. We offer bounds where these uh, sample sizes are adequate. And the same for covariance matrix, which I will show in a minute. So this is this is a um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna I, I like the pictures and I and I save you the, the trouble of looking at, at the at the text but there is a wrong and a right way to do cross validation and this is not us this is actually noted in books it's so typical there are so many anecdotes that <laughs> I found it um, amusing that they put a, a chapter in a book saying please note this and it's and it's that uh, that typically you find in, in many publications, in many works, even, that uh, there are some sort of variable selection process or data uh, cleaning process involved in your 
uh, pipeline of uh, analyzing the data. And often that is done before the cross outside the cross-validation loop. And there should be a big warning there. Uh, because if we do that, cross-validation of, of uh, over-optimistic estimates of their performance. And that's essentially the, the, the message. Uh, but one shouldn't be, it's, 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 it's surprising how often this can happen and how typical it is. In fact, there is a term, uh, someone somehow not, quite not like it, called data leakage in the world of data science. Because there are so many ways in which uh, analysts, data scientists, perform this different task that at the point in which they are trying to estimate an error measurement, um, they have been at fault with this problem without, I would say, without even realizing. So, so some, it's, it's a lesson to, and, and, and then I give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, but so interestingly, um, what the, the right way, and always, is to keep any processing variable selection, um, oversampling, et cetera, of the data inside the uh, cross-validation loop so that the correlation between predictors is balanced. And I refer you to section 7.10.2 of the book. It's quite interesting. Um, I've just been marking um, <laughs> um, several, so about 40 assignments, and, and it's interesting that you repeat this and how easy it is to follow that. So there's another, another, another interesting topic, and, and these are also is sample size and penalized regression. So I give you two interesting references, a long list of references, and I've been recently, I was writing a project proposal, and I've uh, and we have a very highly dimensional data set, but a small sample size in comparison, although everybody's very proud because it's quite big given the, 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 the size, it's 5,000 variables and we have about 900. And then uh, we started uh, thinking, so they asked me, so do we have, so a statistician asked me the question, uh, do we have enough data? So uh, is our sample size right? Uh, and, I, and I was, you know, I said, well, it's interesting. I haven't seen the literature how to do you do the sample size calculation for this kind of model. So it took me out in a in a little journey of literature review, and I found out that actually this is a very hot topic: how to define bounds on how many and, and the bounds are of the type that you see at the top, and some are more loose, or some are more tight. Uh, so k is the number. So P is the number of variables that you have, N is the number of the, uh, the sample size that you have, and K is, if, since you are doing variable selection, you're doing penalized regression, is the number of variables that you are guaranteed to recover faithfully from this model. So I even the interpretation of the regression is, is difficult. Um, and there are many authors that provide different bounds, but it's quite interesting because uh, we went and wrote about, about this. this. I think, yes, we have a, a, a reasonable sample size, and for the kind of data that we have, we don't expect K to be over. So, and we have biological reasons to, to, to justify that. <laughs> and it was really interesting because it, it was very difficult to uh, preach the method that using this type of calculation that is so untypical in the, in the, in the most people is accustomed to the sample, is the under sample size calculation to understand. We, we are giving a bound, not an exact number. So I'll give you two interesting reference and, 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 and the literature is, is glowing with this. Um, this is uh, similar and this is quite a result from one of our research and they said really simple. We, we have the same set but we want to estimate the covariance matrix. So we have like 5,000 dimensions and, and a few, uh, sorry, in this, in this case, this is metabolomic. We have 256 uh, dimensions and around 220 patients. And we say, well, how bad it can get? And this is very simple, okay? It's only the covariance matrix. What we use the covariance matrix for? Well, we use that for, for st st uh, uh, standard statistical analysis. But we also do other type of analysis. We use the correlation matrix to extract networks 
of in between the different bios. So we extract, uh, in this case, metabolite networks, and we analyze what the dog networks have uh, explained uh, as a feature better the outcomes than any single individual metabolite. Um, but for that, the covariance might have to be good. Ah, we find, so the red line that you find there is the standard plug-in uh, estimate of the covariance method. By the way, this problem was noted by Fisher first. It's nothing new. The solutions are more recent. And, and the blue one is what a, the, I would say, state-of-the-art uh, method for estimating the covariance matrix can achieve. And the y-axis is the error, and the x-axis is the sample size. So um, in our study, we are around here. In this area. So if we were to use the standard uh, covariance matrix estimator, um, well, um, we probably should be, uh, it wouldn't, all our prediction and all our analysis will be profoundly biased, whereas even we still got an error, but I think it's managed. And all this, what I'm trying to, to uh, state here is that as a data scientist, you know, you cannot and I completely, uh, you cannot abandon, it's not that you cannot abdicate a relationship with theory of probability and statistics. In fact, if you want to expand the language that you use to connect, uh, and, and I borrow the pre previous metaphor between uh, the data that you serve and your models, um, I think that if you want to expand your language, you have to be more thorough. In, in these areas, and, and it's quite demanding. Um, and now, finally, I don't know how we're doing for time. OK, I tried to cover that. So to, to look at the future. So all this is past. Uh, two, two things at the future. So um, one is uh, we all have, we work with registry data, and data is distributed in, in a country or, or in countries, and, and it's difficult to, to access, and we have these endless uh, uh, inf information governance procedures, etc., cetera. Um, and then we have to preserve, for perfectly good reasons, we want to preserve, preserve patient privacy. So uh, new advances on how to overcome all that and still achieve our aims. And finally, um, what is le looking at models that uh, where the ordering of events happened, and we call that data-driven phenotypes to redefine the seas. So this is one outcome of research, uh, also UCL, also you know, slightly participating. And imagine this is actually running. I invite you to visit that website, Inside Platform. This is support clinical trials. And in clinical trials, you do feasibility analysis. And feasibility analysis, currently, you call the hospitals. You ask how many patients you see with this particular presentation. And they say, well, I see 10 a year. And they collect that information back, and you say, well, let's go ag ahead and invest two million pounds and run the trial. And it fails, because those estimates are poor. Um, this was a, a platform that combines not only the, the ability to count, which is very simple, but that does so by preserving the privacy of the patient and in a distributed way. Uh, the outcome of this is much larger than it looks in that slide. This slide is probably goodness me, 10 years old. Um, is uh, uh, to give you a, an example, every protocol amendment in a clinical trial, on average, might cost half a million dollars to, to make. So if you get it wrong in your feasibility analysis, so, and all that cost just not only delays the time to the time to market, but delays the the, uh, the trial might completely fail. Um, the idea of distributed learning is that we can not only learn counts, but we can learn any statistical concept, uh, any statistical model in a distributed fashion while preserving the privacy of the patient. And I will refer to, to the, uh, sorry, I can give you, but I didn't put the full, the full reference, but I will be happy to provide it later on. Um, so this is the combination of machine learning and, and distributed computing where we found what are the, the, the necessary conditions for learning to occur in, under these characteristics. And finally, um, I have to show that because my daughter likes that flower very much. She thinks that's the best thing I've ever done in my career. <laughs> um, because it's very pretty. 
And, and what we try here is a different kind of models, uh, kind of models where instead of when uh, variables enter a logistic regression, the way in they enter that equation doesn't matter. In these models, the way in which events happen matters. So if I first have a, a stroke and then my cardiac infarction, that's different than the other way around. And if I have many, many fractures and then someone diagnosed with dementia, some, some doctor down the line might say, well, we should have spotted that. Um, so what we do in this research is we look at the curve pathway and the second, which is the clinical view at the top. We have the electronic hair record snapshots. And here we use a metaphor of a camera where the electronic hair record takes pictures at any time. And then from those pictures, what we try to do is to uh, create models and partially observable Markov decision models, which are very difficult to build by hand. So we try to learn them automatically. Uh, that's not that. We, that's uh, just uh, uh, we, so what you see in that uh, flower there are trajectories of patients. This is the ancient patient from UK Dow Bank. Uh, and this describes how they traverse the healthcare system. And then once we can describe how they traverse the healthcare system, we run clusterings and we run all the kind of algorithms to characterize different groups. It's very reassuring that some of the groups that we find, we already know about. But what is interesting is that we find other groups that split a already established group. And what we try to find is whether these patients present in different ways. This, are, this has applications in early diagnosis, so we're looking to apply this in, in cancer, because we want, want to see whether there is an early warning in, in the way the patient present, also in prognosis of the patient. But, but even a low hanging fruit is, uh, can we plan service delivery in a more efficient way, given that we have an estimation of where the patient goes? At the end, what we want is to create uh, individualized uh, patient pathways instead of general guidance. And, and with that, I, I'm going to close. Um, thank you. Any questions? <laughs>